Who am I to speak on the topic of racial justice? As a white, uh, middle-aged, middle-class man, I really don't have the right. And that's frankly because I lack the personal context from which to speak. For my family has never been sold as slaves. I've never had to survive on a dollar a day digging lithium out of the ground for Western people to drive electric cars that are practically free to run for them. My child has never had to dig cobalt for Western smartphones. My home is not about to be swamped by rising floodwaters caused by the output of the Western power stations and traffic. But I do have some personal experience from which to draw when I think about the topic of racial justice. I recall, for example, the day ten years ago when I visited a former slave castle in Cape Coast. I was shown the entrance to the old slave pit. And as you can see from that photo, above the entrance, literally built on top of the doorway to the dungeon, was a small chapel, a Christian place of worship. That chapel, I was told to my shame, was the first Anglican church to be built on the old Gold Coast. Across the road from the slave castle is the cathedral of the Diocese of Cape Coast. The cathedral was built by the British Army. It was a garrison church for the soldiers who worked in the slave castle across the road when the little chapel became too small. For me, it was an immensely humbling experience to be invited to become a canon of that cathedral. On the day of my installation, I addressed a sea of African faces in a church that had once been stocked with smug, white, slave trader smiles. But today is not the day to debate the slave trade. No, today we're being asked to think about justice in a wider sense with a specific focus on racial justice. The focus is our reading of the Sermon on the Mount, which we heard just now on the, in the Gospel reading. So I'd like to unpack some of what that sermon has to teach us. The first thing we might note is that it was a sermon delivered to a diverse group of people. According to the text, people had come to hear Jesus from all over the area, including Tyre and Sidon, which were areas inhabited predominantly by non-Jews. And among the crowd, there would have been representatives from all sections of society, rich, poor, powerful, powerless, and of course, famously, according to the Gospel of Monty Python, cheesemakers as well. Some of you know what I'm referring to. This was a wide and diverse and varied and multiracial section of humanity. What does Jesus say to them? He speaks of justice. In the new kingdom of heaven that he is inaugurating, there's going to be justice for the poor and woe for the rich. The hungry will be filled and the full will be made hungry. Those who mourn will laugh and those who laugh now will mourn and weep. Jesus' words are powerful, aren't they? They predict the consequences of what will happen when those with the power to effect change fail to live up to their sacred duty. A time is coming, according to Jesus' mother Mary, when the mighty will fall from their thrones and the humble and the poor will be lifted up. This is a picture of the topsy-turvy kingdom of God. Everything gets turned upside down when the kingdom comes into full effect. And we know this to be true from our own observations. 
even if we are just amateur students of history, over and over again, the mighty empires of humanity have a tendency to collapse under the weight of their own greed and their corruption and because of their lack of attention to justice, especially justice for the people who have to live under the rule and the influence of such empires. And in this sense, the Bible doesn't so much teach us about what will take place in, in some future time, it shows us what is taking place all around us, all the time. It's not so much that we read the Bible, but that the Bible reads us. We find ourselves reflected in its stories and, and warned by its prophets. In that sense, the Bible is a commentary on the world we live in, as much as it is a description of the world of the past. You see, societies which fail to look after the poor of whatever race, ultimately they collapse. The Egyptians famously exploited the Hebrews and they paid a very heavy price at the time of Moses. The Romans exploited every country that they conquered and they kept other nations outside their, their walls, like Hadrian's Wall. For all its greatness though, the great city of Rome itself fell conquered, ironically, by those it had kept outside its borders. The British Empire, well, it exploited the lands of millions, it took their natural resources, as well as enslaving their peoples. Today, the empire of the G7 exploits every other nation on earth. The poorest people dig in the earth for our lithium, our precious metals, our coffee beans, our sugar, while living in the most impoverished conditions. So while the Bible tells us to take care of the poor of other nations, we do well to listen. Many great empires have come and gone. Our present empire goes under many names. We, we might call it the G7 or perhaps the Western hegemony. There's a word you can look up. But it's an empire, essentially, like those of the past. It lives off the backs of other nations, other races, of, of those who live outside its apparently impregnable borders and the, its military might longing to get inside. But what can you and I do about this? How can, oh sorry, what can we do to, to live out the principles of the kingdom? How can we sow living seeds of racial justice? Bringing about real change means changing our buying habits for one. Making sure that, for example, nothing we buy from our cars to our clothes has come from a sweatshop, a slave market, or has been dug out of the ground by work slaves. It means fighting for the voices of other races with other experiences to be heard in our boardrooms and in our decision-making bodies. Bringing about real change means engaging in the political process. It means lobbying our politicians. It means protesting and making it possible for those with the real power to uh, make it impossible for them to ignore the message of the kingdom. This is a call to prophecy. A call to the task of calling the people to God's way of living and of warning them of the consequences if they do not. So let me leave you, leave you with this challenge. How can we here at St Faith's become a kind of racial justice action centre? What will you do today? What change will you make to the things you buy or the degree to which you educate yourself about where the things you buy come from? 
What will you do to increase the pace of positive change in our political structures? Who are you going to write to today? Where and how will you protest? Who will you bind together with you to make real and meaningful change? And perhaps another question to consider. How much of your personal income will you give to charities that lift up the poor of other countries, of other races? If that's a thought that challenges you, then why not speak to Sue Tinney? Sue, give us a wave. Where are you? I can't. Oh, yeah. Back, back, right back there. Yeah. Standing up and waving. Yeah? There we are. If you don't know who Sue is, why not, why not chat to Sue after the service? I primed her that I'd be saying that. So she's hopefully got a few materials with her. And if not, she can take names and addresses. Talk to her about World Vision and the work it does to lift up the humble and the meek of other races in other places. Of course, other development agencies are also available, as you would say, on the BBC. And when you meet a person of another race outside the walls of this church, will you smile? Will you welcome them in and invite them to taste the new wine of the kingdom? For it is the desire of my heart and it is the thing that I observe so often about this place that all are welcome here. Amen.